Hi, everybody. Whoa. Welcome to West Valley College. It looks like we have mostly students here. For those of you who aren't students, um, welcome. My name is Marianne Mills. I'm a librarian here at West Valley. And um, on behalf of the college, I welcome you all to the Silicon Valley Reads event. This year, Silicon Valley Reads is focusing on the impact of climate change on our lives and is introducing an emerging literary genre, echo fiction, also known as climate fiction. I first want to thank the organizations behind Silicon Valley Reads, who have put together 150 free public events throughout the Bay Area, both in February and March. And I have some handouts here. Um, there are events anywhere like lectures from famous um, people who are environmentalists, also um, ch children's events. So you guys who have kids, this would be a great thing to check out. We're still at the very beginning of the Silicon Valley Reads month of, um, month, two months of, of events. So please feel free to check that out. And everything is, is free. Um, the organizations that are behind Silicon Valley Reads that we, I'd like to thank personally um, or publicly, the Santa Clara County Library District, the Santa Clara County Office of Education, and the San Jose Public Library. We are honored today to have Ben Parzibach, author of Sherwood Nation. He is here to discuss his book with Lenore Harris, one of West Valley's esteemed English instructors. Sherwood Nation is Ben's second novel. His first, Couch, was published in 2008. Among his other projects is the founding of Gumball Poetry, a literary journal published in a gumball, a gumball capsule machine. He co-ran Project Hamad, a campaign to free a Guantanamo inmate by the name of Adele Hamad, who is now free. He is also part owner of Black Magic Insurance Agency, a one-night citywide alternative reality game. Sounds very interesting. Lenore Harris has been an instructor in the English department for over 10 years. She is a, she is an historical novelist, and in 2011, she was awarded the John Steinbeck Fellowship from San Jose State University and the Paul Taylor Fellowship at the Kenyon Review Writers Workshop. Her work has been published in the Prism Review, Spittoon, and the Crab Orchard Review. You guys, the floor is all yours, but wait, I have one more thing for you. Who doesn't want to speak sort of in omnipresent uh, panoramic sound, you know? I mean, everyone should be able to do this. Um, all right, you guys, thanks for coming. Um, I am going to, um, I think what's going to happen is I'm going to kind of talk about the book's genesis, um, where it came from, uh, and maybe read a passage or two, and then we're going to talk, and um, and that's about it. Then uh, you guys are going to ask questions. So, uh, and I hear everyone's grade rises like instantly upon asking a question. So, um, <clears throat> so I, I first, uh, I this book started um, when I was living in Brazil. I lived in Brazil for a short period of time um, in Rio de Janeiro, and that's that's I think in terms of writers, because I know there's a lot of writers here. It's, Raise your hand if you're in Lenora's writing class, just so I have a good sense of it. Awesome. Um, and maybe we'll talk about travel and, and writing later, which I would love to do. But um, I was living in uh, Rio de Janeiro, and I became fascinated with favelas. Uh, favelas are shanty towns um, where, that are not sanctioned by the city. Um, Rio de Janeiro has a very strange uh, topography, and so these, these shanty towns, which can be huge, are sort of uh, barreled up against the sides of these very steep mountains. They have no utilities. Um, they're essentially illegal developments. Um, they're, very, they're built in a wonderfully mishmash, labyrinthine uh, way with tons of concrete. Um, it, there's a picture in the Reader's Guide, I don't know if you have that, of gatoing, and, and gatoing is the process of 
um, stealing electricity from the grid, you essentially run a cable from your own house and jam it straight into an electrical pole. And when you see these, these poles, there are like thousands of wires coming from them. I mean, they're, they're terrifying and hilarious to look at. Um, but I got, uh, really, I spent some time in, in some favelas and was amazed at how some of them definitely were very difficult places to live uh, with a ton of poverty. And in others, there were amazing community organizations that had risen up to sort of fill the gap of this lack of power because the city did not police them, they did not patrol them, they had no influence there. And some of these uh, community organizations were, I mean, essentially they were, they were these governments. They were like, this is like a city with like 12 different independent nations inside of it. And I was, I was totally impressed and amazed by that. Um, and so I, I, start, I had that idea. And then um, I also really wanted to rail against Hollywood's uh, concept of apocalypses. You know, I mean, we have all been living under this. Like, you guys see one of these every year, I'm sure. It's like Hollywood's apocalypses are this lone Western dude who usually saves his, his lady while the rest of civilization crumbles. And it's like alien invasion or meteor attack or dinosaurs or zombies or robot apocalypse, you know, I mean, this is like, you see one of these every year. And we also live with this kind of fear in our lives, you know, whether it's uh, Y2K or avian bird flu or terrorist attacks. I mean, there's always this, this omnipresent fear. Um, and I think that there has been very little evidence in history, of history of the Earth, of actual apocalypses. Um, there have been four major extinctions uh, in Earth's history, um, none of which humans have really been involved in other than causing the last two of them in the Pleistocene era and the Anthropocene era, this one. Um, but there have been innumerable collapses, and that's what really I think is so fascinating is, is, in, is looking at these collapses. And uh, an example I often use is um, in around 50 AD, the Romans invaded this tiny little island backwater called Britain. And uh, they took it under their rule. They civilized it in Roman terms, which may have involved a few nailing to crosses and so forth. Um, but they built these incredible viaducts and architecture um, and essentially held uh, what was called Roman Brittany for 350 years, older than our nation is here. Um, and then in around 400 AD, um, Rome began to have tons and tons of problems. They had uh, incredible economic debt. Um, they were spread far too thin with various wars. They had um, malarial outbreaks, which were insane because they had these wonderful new technologies, farming technologies, which had tons and tons of standing free water. And so they'd have these uh, mosquito infestations that would wreck entire cities. And then, of course, they had the Germanic tribes, the, um, the northern savages attacking. Um, and so they left Britain. Here's a, a tiny little island nation that has been, uh, um, you know, under empire rule for 350 years. And uh, the legionaries go home, their architects go home, uh, some people marry into the community, all this technology is lost, uh, their trade routes are gone, their, their economy collapses, and they have to begin to reinvent themselves. And that's where I think it gets super interesting, you know. You have this, you have this collapsed society um, that is in total chaos, that has no hierarchical rule, and they have to begin to invent themselves. Everybody knows that story. About a thousand years later, uh, Britain becomes the largest empire that the world has ever known. Uh, whether that has to do with the collapse or not, I don't know. But, but I love that point where we think about collapses and, um, and how you reinvent yourself out of it, how, how society can, can reinvent themselves. Um, anyway, so I am going to read a section from this book um, that's pretty far in. Uh, you guys definitely haven't, you, you guys probably have a little sense of the book. Essentially, uh, very quickly, we're in a massive drought. There's been a huge wave of migration to the East Coast until the East Coast cutoff migration. Um, I mean, it's kind of like the California drought, like times 10 kind of thing. Farming is essentially dead. Um, the cities have devolved into little city-states, major West Coast cities, uh, with no large-scale government between them. Uh, because in the Northwest, 85% of our power comes from um, hydrologic uh, resources. 
There's essentially no power except for about one hour per day. Uh, hydrologic resources meaning dams. Um, and in this, there is a woman who's a water activist. Her name's Renee. And uh, I'm going to read you a section from her. There's about eight different viewpoints, POVs, in this book. But um, I'm going to read you a section from her. And, um, and she, she is caught on film. And the media kind of helps augment her image um, and creates a, a hero out of her so that she has, as a, as a populist leader, a ton of power and draws people to her and eventually secedes a section of the city and runs it as her own nation. This is one weekend. She's just waking up um, uh, here. She was of two minds now, and one tinkered on in the background, observing what the other did, while the other commanded a country. She took to carrying a knife around. It was a thin-bladed fish-boning knife, sharp as a razor. It had a subtle curve like a miniature saber and a solid plastic handle. The six-inch blade locked into a plastic sheath, and she wore it attached to her belt. She wore the knife parallel, in place of where a belt buckle would be, so that it took a moment's observation to see that she was indeed armed. She did not wear it to show or to deter. She wore it because she was afraid. She woke that morning out of a dream where soldiers stood around her bed, U.S. Marines shooting into her, and she looked up at them calmly as she felt the blood drain from her body. It had been a surprise to feel along her stomach after she'd woken and find nothing, no blood, no unnatural holes she could dip her index finger into. She lay in bed and let life return to her, trying to push away the feeling of impending doom. These are no end times, she whispered into the room. It was a mantra she'd taken up since her first night in Sherwood, a poem of sorts that had taken shape in her mind, the words reeling out of her. These are no end times. This time is simply a tunnel from one time to the next. I work here to see us through. It was with great strength that she blotted from her mind the end of the mantra, a new addition. I do not see the violence. The last part began to show up on her lips, materializing there out of deep subconscious, tacked on to the end of the mantra unbidden. Who said anything about violence? B was gone, her bed meticulously made, that's her roommate. A single shaft of dawn from the east made it through her north-facing window and burned orange against the west wall. Water, food, security, health, education, that's what she did. And yet, she leaned up out of bed and looked down into the backyard and saw, as always, the small training army there, Jamal in their midst, and she shuddered. Renee divvied her own water share. Her ranger-delivered unit gallon, minus one tax unit, had been left at her door. The remaining 39 units, each 1 40th of a gallon of water, were divided between gallon jugs, old glass apple juice containers. Water to drink, 18 units. To cook with, 10 units. Cleaning, 4 units. Hygiene, 4 units. Miscellaneous, a tomato plant she had on her windowsill, a luxury, or the occasional wetted handkerchief to wipe her brow. One unit. Savings, one unit. She stared at the portion she'd parted away for cleaning, and it looked trivially small, just over 12 ounces of water. She hungered for a shower and a way to properly wash her hair. She breathed in the smell of the water, taking pleasure from its many mysterious sounds. The way of quantity of it sounded in a glass jug, glunk, glunk, or the way the glass rang with the water inside when touched with the blade of her knife. She could delegate this, but divvying water was a vital ritual, a uniting one. She imagined herself performing the task in synchronicity with everyone else in Sherwood, like a morning prayer. Today, she would work on the clinics. She'd find doctors and nurses who understood her, who knew that these were not end times, who may be persuaded to work locally in their fledgling nation and not in the hospitals. Nearly every day, they carried bodies to the Rose City Cemetery, people who had died because of dysentery or bloodshed, dehydration-related symptoms, old age, or the relentlessly boring pace of an apocalypse in slow motion. Fewer died than before she'd come, she reminded herself. They dug holes where they could find the space. She'd been to more than a few of these, wielding a shovel and talking to families and drawing off some of the hate and grief and taking it into herself. Afterward, the survivors told their friends and family that Maid Marian had come to the funeral and wept. Time is simply a tunnel, she told herself. From one time to the next, there is no end. There are no end times. Even without her, with her personal end, say a marksman's bullet taking her down, there was no end. She was only time's helper, a temporary worker. She ate the breakfast a ranger brought her in the map room. No one else was yet in the room, and this was when she loved it best. 
when all of Sherwood was only hers. It was in the early morning when she composed her notes. Later they were printed by her team in a flurry in Sherwood's computer room, so many to a page in the hour of electricity. Or hand-lettered in mass when technical difficulty made it necessary. Her breakfast plate was divided into sections, rations on one side, a mottled piece of tinned fish, and a clumpy bit of bulgur or something of its ilk, and on the other, a fried egg given to her by some citizen and cooked with reverence by some other. She tore into the egg. A surprising number of chickens were found in the territory, and they were also on her list. They needed roosters. Surely there was at least one lucky rooster in the territory. They needed a flock. These are no end times. This is the beginning of time. And then it hit her. This was the beginning, and time needed to reflect that. She pulled the calendar off the map room wall and stared at it. She would make July 17 the new Independence Day, the day when the nation of Sherwood rose up. But the year bothered her, sitting at the corner of the calendar with its four ungainly digits, its 2,000 years of baggage. She didn't want that tacked onto any Sherwood holiday. She grabbed a marker from their meeting table and scratched a black patch over the year. Beside it, she hesitated. Was it the year zero or the year one? How does time begin? In binary numbers, she remembered, zero was off, one was on, one was yes. And so she wrote a big, chunky one on the calendar. Yes. Dear Sherwood, July 24th, year one, she wrote. Welcome to the end of week one in the year one of your new country. She doodled then in the margin for a moment as she thought back on her week in which she had asked them to have faith. She had nailed it. She had so nailed it. She fidgeted at the edge of the paper there, trying to figure out how to word things in the way an A student futzed with the margins of a perfect essay before turning it in. A moment of reflection to delay the praise that was sure to come. Informally, her approval rating was in the 90s. Watery, water delivery and street safety were now a given in a single week. There's no way the citizens of Sherwood would look back now. Thanks, you guys. OK. Hi, Lenor. Oh, you didn't get and psyched. Hi. I yes um, yeah that's a funny uh, that's a funny place to start it, you know I, it, I I feel uneasy about that I feel like um, I mean I started writing this before there were very many climate novels at all I did I never really even considered it and I also to ascribe it to its own sort of narrow genre I, I feel like genres often are a disservice to us. My first book um, started out as a literary book and then wandered into fantastical stuff. And uh, when I first started sending it out there, the literary agents were like, I, you know, we like it, but like, where would it go in a bookstore? It doesn't like, there's no, sh would I put it on fantasy or would I put it on literary? And uh, so I, I feel like that's sort of tricky. Limiting. Yeah, I feel like it's, I feel like it's limiting. Um, and I feel like, uh, you know, what you expect when you, read it sets a certain expectations like oh my gosh there's going to be lots of climate change stuff and stuff like that and i feel like in the end the book ends up being much more about um, resource scarcity and how a community handles that and can thrive in that type of genre <laughs> i was curious about you um, you mentioned it when you Um, right. Well, I mean, I think that there are there are am there's ample evidence um, hi historically for the declines of empires because they're often cataloged and logged. Um, you know, whether it's the Greeks or the Romans or um, the Caliphates in the Middle East or um, the British Empire is certainly our most 
vivid example where they went from owning really a third of the land terrain on Earth to back to being a tiny island. Um, and, I, and I find those really fascinating. Uh, there's also been uh, numerous cases where, um, like the Mayan collapse um, is thought now, it happened around 800 AD, and certainly there were lots of Mayans that, that continued to stay and thrive in, in central Mexico, but, but primarily it's a very similar case to what's happening now, which is that they built their society on a certain expectation of how the climate was, built farming habits, built waterways around that. And they were a very sophisticated uh, civilization. And then they hit a 40-year drought, um, which inevitably that kind of drought creates a resource scarcity, which often starts a war. And um, so, yeah, that's what the kind of stuff I researched. And, and, that, and from that, you were able to get like these details about the, the everyday way of life. I'm, I'm just saying, as a, for me as a, as, a, as a historical novelist, it's often easy to get um, the information that's theoretical and global, yeah. but those fine details about how people live on a day-to-day -day basis sometimes can be hard to grasp. And I'm thinking particularly for the areas that you're talking about, that that might be kind of difficult to track down. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's really interesting, and I, and I hadn't thought about it from that perspective because I mean, really, if we're talking about genres, I suppose there's a way you could call this historical fiction in a way too. I, I alternate present is how I've often heard it described. Whoop! The ship has landed. Uh, the um, and so, I mean, I think it was it. My task is a little bit easier than a task that you may have uh, when you're when you're writing about a specific historical time, because a lot of what um, what I had to do is research what happens when there's a lot of resource scarcity, how bonds are formed or not formed, um, how people handle it with extra struggles that they have to go through to obtain what they need to do to help their families. And then, of course, I make a lot of stuff up. <laughs> I'm not supposed to say that? I don't know. I didn't make anything up. Sure yeah. appreciates that. <laughs> I was thinking about um, the process of making it up, right? Thinking about the crafting of character. One of the things that you also talked about in a different interview, I believe it was, was about the creation of a female protagonist, mm -hmm. right? So um, um, I want to ask you this as a, as a writer. What does uh, having a female, well, first of all, there's a couple of things. Talk to um, the students about the definition of a dictator. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. I, I, I love that. Right. Um, and also about your name as a, as a dictator and what the creation of a, a female protagonist does to your story. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to. So, uh, so Dic the word dictator comes from the Latin. It was originally the Romans invented the office. Um, it had no negative connotations. It was essentially someone that the council uh, elects to um, have absolute control over a time of incredible emergency. Okay, So you've got the Germanic hordes coming down out of the mountains, and you need somebody who can make really quick decisions that you trust and, and doesn't have to go through long processes. And um, so, I mean, I spent some time, uh, when I wrote this, um, I was fairly frustrated with the political process and political systems, unlike now, because everything's totally fine now, of course. Uh, and, um, and, I, and I began to wonder about something like uh, climate change or these, these massive hurdles that we, that we argue about in such minute, petty little detail while they continue to spin out of control and how we might best address that. And, and I mean, there's amazing dictators in history. The, the word has a bad name, and I think rightfully so. But a, like Mustafa Ataturk, who was a dictator in Turkey for, uh, I think, late, 18th, uh, late 19th century. And he um, created an amazing secular society that uh, refocused itself on education and civil rights. 
um, gave rights to women. That's why Turkey is such a radically different society than, than many of the other more conservative Middle Eastern countries. Um, and so I think that in some cases, that kind of system would be much more efficacious. Can I use that word? Is that a word? Uh, against, um, against some of these emergencies. I'm not necessarily advocating that we go to having a dictator. Uh, the choices are not real great at the moment anyway. Uh, and so because of that, because I was frustrated with the political process and, um, and frustrated with um, how, like for example, climate change was being addressed, um, I kind of wanted to turn everything on its head. And it just, it just did not feel natural to me at all to have um, a man who we are so, we have such easy stereotypes about in dictatorial roles um, ascending to that level of government. I felt like uh, it was a lot more possible to um, play out uh, how a woman might um, ascend into that role and manage that role much more differently than, than a man. And, and it was particularly fun to flip the, um, the relationship between boyfriend and girlfriend in that role as, as opposed to Hollywood's normal tropes. So, in what ways do you think that um, Renee, as a female protagonist, is different than, let's say, if you had a, a, a male in that particular role? What yeah. bring to the table? I think that's different. Well, I think that one thing that she did, you know, and this this is this already becomes, uh, you know, there's the danger of uh, stereotyping on gender here as you as you wander into this. But I think one thing that Renee did, and I and I felt like this came from from her was realize immediately that she needed to pull in certain parts of her fledgling nation, parts of that neighborhood, and incorporate them immediately into her administration. Like, there's a, a main character who is um, kind of a, an old school drug dealer who has been essentially typecast by the society around him. He's, drug dealer is not the right term. He's more of like a kingpin. He's like a mob boss in a way. And, um, and he was, he was a wonderful character to write, but he's, I mean, he's essentially been typecast by the society around him. And so she pulls him in, and that, and it, within this totally new society, this new construct, it gives him the opportunity to sort of reimagine who he might be on the other side of the law. Um, yeah. And it was nice. I think that it seems to me like reinvention is a theme that recurs throughout the, throughout the novel. The city is reinventing itself. Renee has to re is forced to reinvent themselves, and all of the citizens who are not not just the citizens of, Sher of Sherwood Nation, but also the, the citizens generally in Portland have to reinvent themselves. And it appears that the people who are unwilling to do that are the ones who um, who are, who cause the city's most uh, suffering. Like when I'm when I'm thinking particularly about the the character of the mayor. And all of the citizens who seem to be stuck in Portland clinging to um, an idea of a society that was, yeah. right? That um, a paradigm that no longer exists, but they are, um, even, even the general to a certain extent, right? Are trying to hold on to this paradigm that no longer exists, right? But they're willing to, to do whatever it takes, right? In order to maintain the illusion that it still exists. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... And I think that's, I mean, that's the tricky thing about droughts is that they operate on a, on a human time scale that we just don't understand. So part, part of the problem there is I think that, that old Portland is clinging to the idea that a shift in the weather will end their problems, whereas there are others who are, are planning more long term for their altered environment. Uh, and how to handle resources and 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 government within that context. Um, yeah. Um, one of the things that I, I noticed about you, and I think that it feels like that's a, 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 or at least from what I've read, and that seems to be mirrored in the, in the spirit of the novel, is this idea of entrepreneurship and advocacy and activism. And I was wondering how much of your own personal experience, well, I and mean, I think this is true of all, all writers, but thematically, how much of that, um, um, so how do I, I don't know how to phrase it, 
um, entered the novel? Was that was that deliberate? Was that unconscious? Or yeah, I, I mean, I'd love to hear you speak on this too. But I, I mean, that's that's such a fun question to answer, you know, because you know that like, so there's the parts of you that you you sort of bury because they're they're societally uh, unacceptable, you know. Like, <laughs> I know that there's part of the mayor in me, like he's kind of this a hole uh, who loves to sit around and play video games, <laughs> and and he's uh, and he's struggling. He's struggling a lot with. Um, with being someone who originally was was a, a lauded mayor and and very popular, and because of this crisis has fallen from grace and is not and does not know how to handle it. And so, yeah, I don't know. I, it's it's really fun to write those characters because um, you get to be as bad as you want to be and and have no consequences because they're going into a novel. Uh, um, so I, I and and I think that all you know all characters um, contain facets of your of yourself at least at least of me, uh, but I also just I borrow from people I know endlessly, um, and then I try not to tell them, <laughs> <laughs> see if they recognize themselves later. Because you are you are an, you are an activist. Yeah. Right. You are also an entrepreneur. <laughs> like you created your own. Um, Literary journal, mm -hmm. right? Very creatively, I might add. Nice. Um, and the Black Magic Insurance Agency. I actually, do, I, like, I actually want to know more about that. <laughs> I know. I, 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 was, I was reading. I was like, it's an alternative, and I know these guys want to know more about that. Right. So, can you tell us more about? It? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. So, um, oh my gosh, the Black Magic Insurance Agency is super fun. We, it's usually a team of uh, four or five people, and we'll plan it for months in advance. Um, and what you do is you're, you're telling a story. It's, it's a narrative, but you're building it into the fabric of the city. So we'll do stuff like, um, you know, we had one like 3 a.m. time where we went through neighborhoods burying these boxes with keys in them. And these box, the keys went to um, went to this locker that we'd acquired that uh, that had like you know uh, 50 boxes in it or something like that. We didn't know where that was going to go yet, but we had like 20 different neighborhoods where we'd buried these boxes, and then we sat and let them rot for two months. Um, and so what we did, the last one we did, it was uh, it was a fun sort of thing about uh, voter fraud, and a reporter had gone missing. So what you this is sort of unbelievable to try to explain this. No one's actually asked me this. This is kind of great. Yeah. Yeah. So, and we never learned how to scale it very well, but the last time we had 100 people, that was our limit. There was sort of a waiting line to get in to, the, to play the game. And the, you'd have teams of four, and we would drive by in a van, and we'd chuck a suitcase out of the window, and this suitcase would, would begin them. And it was like the reporter's suitcase who was investigating voter fraud, and he'd gone missing. And uh, and inside of it, you know, it was like uh, a little bit of gin and all these notes that he'd taken on where stuff was. And, you know, you'd have, um, and then all through the night, we have it go on for about six hours. And um, and we, you know, you, you, you do, you have people planted in like bars. So you, they'll go into the bar and they have to order a certain kind of drink in order to get to the next clue. We'll bake uh, clues into like, um, we had a donut shop. They had to go order the right donut kind of thing. Um, and then we'd, we'd placed numerous false ads in newspapers. And then we had like these, this giant projection that covered one side of a building. Anyway, oh, <laughs> it was this kind of thing. So it was great. It's, it's an insane amount of work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it's, it's really fun. Yeah. And so, yeah, so you're. And you still do this? Uh, I do it every few years. It's, I have to go through a recovery period. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, you, it's, you're building a narrative, right? But it's, um, and the teams are competing, and they have a general sense of how they're doing against each other because, you know, you'll go into a bar and ask a bartender, and they'll be like, oh, yeah, you're the fourth, you're the fourth person that's asked for that drink tonight. Weird. <laughs> uh, so anyway, that's, that's yeah. Yeah. And, that, and again, that seems still in keeping with the spirit of the novel. I think that there's a lot of mysteries. I mean, I mean, in, in, in many ways, it feels uh, 
like a, a mystery and um, uh, a treatise, I think, on, on, on how to survive uh, the collapse of society. Oh, this was a question I thought I thought about as I as I reached the end of the novel. Do you feel that uh, Renee and her band of uh, Mary and Renee are ultimately successful? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Were you going to finish no, no, that? No, no, okay. okay. Yeah. I mean, so not to give away too many spoilers. Um, oh no, actually, I'll just give, uh, give the spoilers away. The nation falls uh, at the end. But but I think that the thing that is. Um, Things that have had the most impact in history are, are not single instances, they are ideas. Right. And she's absolutely successful in planting the idea of, of micronations, community nations. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I think that her, and I, I mean, I think that's why it's, it's so important is it, it, to, to continue to be active and have these kinds of actions because, um, because it's the ideas that are the most powerful thing. It sounds sort of trite and cliche, but it's absolutely true. I mean, there were, there were so many failures leading up to the French Revolution, but the idea of um, liberty and being free of the hierarchy of, of royalty was an idea who, that could not be suppressed, no matter how many guns they had turned on it. So, yeah, I, I think they are successful. That's what I wanted them to be, anyway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I think that like the front, the covers of books are really important to getting people's attention. I really like the covers of um, Sherwood Nation and also Couch. Um, they're very minimalistic, but they still catch your eye. And I was wondering like what kind of input you had on that, because like with Sherwood Nation, it's very like the symbol, which um, from the excerpt that I got to read, it seems like Maid Marian is very much a symbol. Um, so what your input of the covers were? Yeah, so they're actually both done by the same artist, um, Andy Watson, a British uh, cartoon artist. Um, and yeah, that's I actually I love to hear you say that because I'm actually not I'm not this is an argument that you have with your publisher. I'm always not a huge fan of this cover. I I loved the cover for Couch, and I think this is really interesting because this symbol is used in the book. She is used as a symbol in the book. People start s spray painting her her face in the book, which is super awesome. But I also um, because there are so many viewpoints in the book, I, I just. I, I wanted I wanted to I wanted to have the idea that Sherwood Nation wasn't just Maid Marian, you know. So I, I wanted a sort of grander scale uh, cover, but you know, you you it's a collaborative thing. When you're working with a publisher, you you just you don't have some choices sometimes. And I and who knows, I mean they may be that's the other thing that they tell you is like you do the writing, we actually know how to sell your book. <laughs> so <laughs> So you argue back, and they're like, mm. uh, anyway. Uh, but I'm glad to hear you say that because I have a lot of people have said, oh yeah, I love your cover, and I think, oh, all right, well, it's one on their team. <laughs> <laughs> Just joking. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Here's one. Oh, one question that's kind of come to my mind, and as I heard some explanations of the premise of the story, is like. One of them was, uh, did the uh, drought out that's currently going on in California have any influence on this as well? Oh, or is, because California's going through a drought right now, so. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's a funny thing. I started this book in, in uh, 2008, really before there was any real drought here. But I did kind of look around for a, um, I mean, I, want, I wanted to create a scenario like a drought, which was like a very slow motion apocalypse. A, 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 you heard her use that term, um, a, a collapsing period. Um, and droughts are actually responsible for like the majority of collapses of societies because they're, they're devastating. 
Um, but no, I didn't even know about, I mean, I didn't, there was no information about a California drought until after I was deep, deep into the book, and I thought, oh, no. <laughs> it's not my fault. Uh, but, uh, so it was kind of, kind of happening as you were writing it. Yeah, exactly. What was, what was the difference to you? Yeah, and so I feel like um, last year was the year that the drought here really began to hit the media, right? Or do you feel like it was 2014? Uh, it was... Probably eight here in the last two years. Yeah. 14. 2014, yeah. So I turned in my, the finished manuscript went in in May of 2014, uh, and I had, didn't make any changes to it since. So it would, be, it would have been kind of interesting to watch the drought happen and make changes to the manuscript just to see what, like I was just told that uh, California's lost 12 million trees. Um, and it's kind of crazy, you know. So who knows what would happen if it if it does or if it if it continues. And the fires, yeah, all right. <clears throat> Thanks. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, so I know that you had talked about seeing this novel as sort of um, an alternate presence. But at the same time, you have this mechanism, the, the drought, that inevitably has to take a certain number of years for it to occur. So how do you sort of balance those ideas without feeling like you're alienating the reader? Ooh. Uh, you just fake it. <laughs> no, I, I don't know. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I never, I don't think I ever put a year on it. Um, and because I, I had the, you know, one, one sure way to tell how time has progressed and where we are in history is to show the technology associated with it. And, and yet I kind of gave myself the gift of eliminating most technology in the book because there was no power, there's no electricity. So there's some scenes that involve batteries and, um, and you know, attempting to use a phone and stuff like that. But for the most part, um, Sherwood Nation has to invent all of their technologies and they're non-electronic, they're non-electric. Um, so, yeah, so that, that, that made it easier. Um, I mean, and the other thing that's kind of associated with that is, is just the idea of, of whether a drought of this magnitude could ever happen in the Portland area, which is known to be incredibly rainy. When I left um, yesterday, it was like 40 degrees and rain was going sideways. Um, and I talked to a number of hydrologists, and they're basically like, no, th that can't happen here. And then I wrote it anyway. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's you. My, my, I don't consider my job to be to predict the future or to really make even realistic scenarios. Um, I'm, I su subscribe to the sort of uh, Bradbury and Heinlein theory of science fiction where it's social science fiction which your your what you do is you put people in alternate situations to see how they behave with one another um, and that's that's the real fun for me so thanks thank you <laughs> so I know so I know you talked about the favelas before and just now the social science fiction what makes you passionate about what's considered speculative fiction over romance or science fiction in the more common sense or fantasy? What makes it that you want to write this? Yeah, good question. Uh, do I know that answer? Um, you know, in my first book that started off as literary fiction and then drifted into fantasy, um, I mean, I think it's just like a childhood of having read thousands of fantasy and sci-fi books just totally immersed in them and and having trouble sticking to one genre in that case um, I love literary fiction today I mostly read literary fiction but but I feel the pressure of these genres prodding at me um, but I also uh, it's very in order to create this kind of book, I don't think you could really do it other than with speculative fiction, unless you hosted it out of the country somewhere, um, because it requires a, a mass um, setting change, really. So I don't know if I, had, I did a good job answering your question. Maybe I don't know that answer. <laughs> I'll fake it. Oh, um, for 
for our students, can you talk a little bit about your writing background and, and what sure. drew you to write? Because I read that you were, um, your background is in programming, actually. Yeah. So how did you um, flip the switch? So yeah. Uh, well, I, um, all right. So I first started out, I'd always been interested in writing, and I, I went to this college called the Evergreen State College in Washington. I don't know if anybody has heard of it, but um, it was a very unusual school. Um, you don't get grades. You, what you do is you write these torturous multi-page uh, uh, self-examinations, <laughs> evaluations, thank you. And, um, and the classes there are often take place for a year at a time. You sign on to a class, and that's all you do for the entire year, um, like all 16 credits for three quarters. Um, and I was, I, the reason I went there is because I wanted to do alternative energy design. And uh, I was really into physics. I was behind in a couple of math classes. It was incredibly competitive to get into this class. And I didn't get in, but they, he only teaches it like once every two years. And so I'd have to be like, I'd have to wait for another three years to go for it. Um, so I was like, oh, screw it. So I ended up taking a playwriting class instead for a year. Um, and uh, by the time, and it's funny because I was in the class for like a week and the, the professor from the alternative energy design class called me up. He's like, why didn't, why aren't you at class? And I had misread the schedule or I'd been last on the list and somebody dropped and they, I was, anyway. But thank goodness I didn't go into that because there's like no money in alternative energy design. Um, <laughs> But anyway, uh, so I had this sort of, like I had a fateful accident there, I think, that, that put me into that. And I just, I loved it. I loved writing plays. It was, it was incredible. Um, and then, um, let's see, where is this story going? Um, the, uh, so I graduated. Um, I went, I moved immediately to New York City. Um, actually, before that, I had this other really crazy writing experience where I got hired to be a ghostwriter for the governor of Washington State. So, and the most awesome part of that is he had this, like, you know, this is, this is some time ago. This is the pre-electronic age. And he had this giant machine that was kind of like a sewing machine. You put a, a blue marker in, and it would spin this big wheel. And you'd hold a paper under there, and it would sign his signature. It was totally great. And so everybody I knew got letters from the governor. It's like, yeah, I'm going to tell you how awesome you are. Here's the governor's signature. Uh, so I was mis misuse of uh, government uh, property at that point. Um, uh, and then I moved to New York City, and, um, and I just 